Hello and welcome to News Click. Since NDA 2 has come to power, there has been a continuous attack on education. Change in course structure, scrapping of different courses in different states. So to discuss the issue, we have with us Lalita Ramdas, a leading activist and also founding member of Greenpeace India. Hello ma'am, welcome to News Click. Since the Modi government has come to power and recently the budget that has come yesterday, there has been a cut on in terms of the primary education that's provided around 5,000 crore rupees. So how do you see that? How, what's, what, what, how do you perceive the agenda of this government? Ah, uh, now it's a, it's a, I think it's a much wider question than actually the agenda of just this government. And I think that for many of us who've been working in the broad social sector area, which is education, which is health, which is women, um, basic fundamentals, I think we would say that we have been fighting this battle of adequate allocation of resources for a very long time. Um, I don't have the figures on my fingertips, but I think we probably, India as a country, comes very, very low amongst even the developing countries in terms of what we actually spend on education. Till now, I don't think we've ever reached anywhere near the 6% of GDP, which is what was the actual recommendation. So I think one has to look at it in that kind of context. Uh, and certainly, I think that the kind of cuts imposed by this uh, government on all social sector spending is just one more nail in the coffin, in a way. Um, it's also in keeping with the push towards privatization in probably every sphere that we can look at, including in education and health. And uh, I think there's a very, very major cause to be worried and concerned about it. Because I want to actually look at it in terms of what it is going to be doing to generations of young people, the children in our schools, who we are providing completely substandard educational opportunities to. Um, we have had a number of the so-called, um, you know, whether it is the non-formal education, the adult education and the various schemes, which in one way or the other are in various hierarchies of less than the ideal quality education that we are talking about. Yeah, actually when you talk about this thing, there's, it's also a double speak on part of the government. On one hand, they claim to build a skilled India, allotting funds for them. And on the other hand, similarly, if you look at the higher education, IITs, IIMs and the UGC, they have cut fund by uh, almost 50%. So there's a double speak also that exists on part of this government. The other important point which you raise is the content or the quality of education that is being provided. I think that's a major thing to look at because if you look around the states where BJP is in power, they are cutting down the courses and uh, I mean importing mythology into it instead of concrete uh, theoretical subjects. So can you throw some light on that? Oh, this will probably take me a few hours. It's one of my favorite subjects. Um, about in the 80s when a group of us actually started and founded a small non-governmental organization. And I'm aware that today the NGO is a word that is not in favor. Uh, but it was a group called Ankur, uh, Society for Alternatives in Education. And I think that my efforts have been systematically engaged with looking at both equality of opportunity looking at how we're going to get more girls into the schooling system, but much more importantly, looking at the content of education. Because unless we are clear that starting from the kindergarten, we need to be building generations of young people who are encouraged to question, who are encouraged to think, who are encouraged to rebel, who are encouraged to be innovative, I believe that the skilling India that we are talking about today is actually going to be very difficult to achieve. And it's a great pity that we have never learnt 
the right lessons from China, who spent their you know, early decades basically investing in health and education. So today, no matter what be the actual changes that are happening, they are able to reskill a workforce or a population or people who already had the fundamental skills. So your starting levels were that much higher. And I think that that is actually one of the biggest challenges to us. How do we build all round citizens in, in our schools and colleges who will today then not uh, have to be um, educated, made to understand what do we mean by nationalism. So that is an important point you have raised. What do you understand by nationalism? So, I mean, if you look at the primary education when this entire debate is going out, people are coming and delivering lectures on what the idea of nationalism is in the universities. While for schools, the government is giving dictates that central schools should have fla Indian flags. Do you think that will lead to a skill generation or nationalism? As I said, each one of these questions is so deep so complex. Um, I always like to go back to maybe a more personalized, experiential way in which to address some of these questions. Uh, for nearly 23 years now, we have lived in a small village across the harbour from Mumbai. This is the Konkan region of Maharashtra in Alibagh. And there's a small group of us who've been working systematically for nearly 15 out of those years, in looking at what's going on in the village schools, in the Zilla Parishad schools. Why are there large numbers of kids who simply cannot make it beyond standard six? And I think it has been probably one of the great um, uh, learnings for me to see what actually goes on in the classroom today. First of all, we took away even your basic examination. So, teachers, for the most part, find it easier just not to worry about teaching because they don't have to worry about their passing the exams. They're also overburdened by syllabus. They have themselves never been taught to think outside of the framework of that particular textbook or the syllabus. So there's a kind of a taken for granted understanding of the importance of flag, the importance of a kind of a prayer to Saraswati um, and which has not been negative but what it has done over time combined with the influence of um, TV serials which are preaching only a particular kind of thing or an image of patriotism and nationalism. So today when something like what happened in JNU uh, you know is brought forth by every TV channel in the most negative kind of way, including what happened in HCU in Hyderabad before this, the average response from the non-urban public, children, young people in colleges, Are, aisa to hona nahi chahiye tha. Ye to deshdrohi hai. Without even applying a little bit of thought, reflection and criticism to actually what happened, have they really been wanting to preach disintegration and fragmentation of the country? Or like all of them who are at some point or the other busy shouting slogans, that's not anti-national. But where JNU and HCU and a few of the big universities have been exposed to the great privilege of good minds, good teachers talking about what is nationalism, the rest of the country gets their lessons from TV channels, films, serials and their schools. So I think, and this is what I spoke about at JNU last week, uh, two days ago, that we need to move out of our temples of higher learning. We have to take these lectures, the content, the ideas, the debates, but in a non-confrontationist manner out into our village schools. All those kids come from every part of this country. Go back there. Take time in your holidays. Bas ja ke logon ke saath baith ke gappe lagao. Then talk a little bit about nationalism kya hoti hai. What is patriotism? 
are you a patriot how do you know am i a patriot or not a patriot how do we define that i think it will push people to start thinking and we threw away civic studies in our schools without even thinking about the fact that the building bricks of citizenship and understanding constitution desh vagara vagara has to be in there uh, how do you see this entire attack i should say on the higher education at present now because you raised two important universities one being the jnu and another being hcu and these are not merely two universities the bardwan university jadavpur university and the list goes on yes. so how do you see that i see that as being part of a much wider deeper um i don't like to use the word conspiracy but i think it's part of a longer older plan by which you sort of destabilize and weaken the processes of thought and reflection and as i said interrogation of ideas particularly that liberal arts and humanities uh subject courses and curricula in universities actually are meant to provide and that is that has been part of the right wing agenda and we know it goes back all the way to pre independence but i think there's another factor and we tend to uh, overlook that because let's face it in all these years after liberalization there has been a particular kind of technical education which has been sort of preferred and which has been given all the resources all the high profile uh, you know publicity that you require because we have gone along with the with the belief that it is technology and science also as technology not so much as scientific understanding temperament absolutely and i think this has been one of the most dangerous things that's actually happened to our education system per se because when you have a purely technological approach in all these you know thousands of of institutes of its computer science its technology its all of that um you tend not to understand what is the more humanistic vision that i think a country its constitution is based on so if you today are faced with a savarkar and a golwalkar interpretation of what is nationalism rather than being exposed to a tagore who also wrote and thought and expressed himself on nationalism then you can imagine what is going to happen and i think that we have to stop thinking that these are accidental developments i think that citizens in whatever walk of life we are in we need to actually get into this debate no matter where we are interrogate policy question it and ultimately start kids to get kids to start thinking and to argue and to debate and i just like to give you one little example again क्रिकेट इज द थिंग दैट वी ऑल गो मैड अबाउट इन दिस कंट्री कुछ साल पहले हमारे गाँव में एक यू नो स्कूल में मैं गई थी एंड आई वॉज जस्ट हैविंग लिटल चैट विद द होल बंच ऑफ किड्स एंड वी वर टॉकिंग अबाउट सम क्रिकेट इंडो पाकिस्तान क्रिकेट मैच विच वॉज हैपनिंग तो आई जस्ट सेड सो हु आर योर 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 फेवरेट क्रिकेटर्स सो वन लिटिल बॉय ही कुड नॉट हैव बीन मोर देन अबाउट टेन ईयर्स ओल्ड इन intuitively and impulsively he said shoaib and then he put his hand over his mouth and he looked around at his friends i said ruk kyu gaye nahi wo pakistani hai na wo hamare dushman hai to shayad mujhe ye bolna nahi chahiye tha so then we went into another half an hour long discussion about sport about cricket about why should you worry after all they may be temporarily we are told that they are dushman but they are people like you and i they play cricket so you should feel happy that you understand that shoaib akhtar is a great uh, cricketer so but you see this is where it all begins and i think that's our danger signals
which we have to at, at, you know pay attention to that's a very positive note i think to leave on that interrogation interrogation of the ideas is the important step ahead thanks a lot for giving us your time and we'll be coming back to you on such issues thanks a lot thank you for asking me to come thank you for watching news click